I first became acquainted with Dr. Bobgan by telephone about 20 years or so ago. Uh, Dr. Bobgan uh, has authored several books related to uh, uh, the relationship of psychotherapy to counseling. He's written books with such uh, challenging and pass, uh, passive titles as Psychohera Psychoheresy, uh, Prophets of Psychoheresy, uh, Prophets of Psychoheresy 2. He has done much to uh, uh, win friends and influence people by the things that he has uh, said in, the, in these books. And when I was a relatively young pastor wrestling with a lot of these issues, uh, I found that he had wise counsel and had the opportunity to just call him on the phone and talk through a lot of things. And I just met him for the first time uh, yesterday after 20 years of talking through various things on the phone. So I'm going to ask him to come up. Is the Bible sufficient? <clears throat> Both of my talks have to do with the sufficiency of the Bible. And you would think that uh, <clears throat> throughout the evangelical church, uh, there would be no argument about the sufficiency of the Bible. <clears throat> but in my first talk, I'm going to talk about the rise and spread of what I call psychoheresy. <clears throat> and uh, in my second talk... I'm going to talk about psychoheresy, what we call psychoheresy, debunked. Now, in my second talk, I'm going to <clears throat> name pastors that you all know. I'm going to name organizations. I'm going to name <clears throat> a number of uh, clinics, uh, mission agencies, and a lot more. And these people, regardless of what they say, they do not totally depend upon, believe in, rely upon the sufficiency of the Word of God. And as a matter of fact, when I name names, I will exclude naming people in this room because there are people in this room who don't have a full sufficiency of Scripture position. Okay, going to <clears throat> the Bible, we find that... <laughs> I first met Tommy Ice, <laughs> and he was in the audience. I think he was a, a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, and Dave Hunt and I were speaking, and he was back in the audience, and that's my first meeting of him. But over the years, he's known me pretty, pretty generally and pretty specifically from our work. So he knows that eventually I'm going to mention names, but at the end of the second talk. <laughs> <clears throat> The Apostle Paul, he uh, warned the Corinthians and all of us to this day that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And you see this repeated with Paul. He talks about the wisdom of men. He talks about the wisdom of God. And what about the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is actually the power that God has given us. And so what we have here is a spiritual battleground that is between the wisdom of God and the wisdom from the world, the flesh, or the devil. What we're dealing with here, and very few see it, is two different faith systems. These are competing faith systems. I'm going to uh, just say that one of the competitions, one of the big competitions in the church today comes from psychology. The field of psychology covers a lot of disciplines and <clears throat> a lot of people say the Bobgins are opposed to all of psychology. That's never been true. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is to first give you what we're opposed to and if you hang on to that, as I'm talking about psychology, what I'm really doing is talking about a specific type of psychology. The American Psychological Association has over 50 divisions. Division 29 is psychotherapy. When I say psychology in my talks, I am talking about psychotherapy and its underlying psychologies. Also, I'm talking about personality theories, and personality testing. I'll talk in my. Uh, I'll say some things about personality testing in my second talk. Psychotherapy, and I think everybody knows this, but just in case, 
is conducted by psychotherapists such as psychiatrists, psychologists, marriage and family therapists, and social workers. My two talks have to do with the following three statements, and I realize that uh, one of them is rather severe, but I think I'll provide enough evidence for, if you're open to it, you'll, you, uh, hopefully you'll be convinced too. Uh, the Bible is sufficient to minister to the personal, marital, and family problems of living, and here's where people get uh, off and misrepresent us. The end of this is normally taken to a psychotherapist. Don't lose that. <clears throat> Psychotherapy with its underlying psychologies is a worldly, fleshly, or demonic counterfeit for what God has already provided in his word. It is a counterfeit. It's competition. And the third one... <clears throat> Psychotherapy with its underlying psychologies is one of the biggest and most demonic deceptions in the church today. Why? Because it has to do with the sufficiency of the Word of God versus what has been provided by men. It's this competition that's going on. Okay, what is this deception? <clears throat> well, this deception is what we call psychoheresy. What is psychoheresy? <clears throat> When it comes to problems of living, <clears throat> normally taken to a psychotherapist, the Bible is sufficient, period. Psychoheresy is adding psychological theories and therapies to the Bible. It is using the very wisdom of men that God has told us to stay away from. <clears throat> the wisdom of God is sufficient. <clears throat> what we find here is the wisdom of God in his word is sufficient for godly living and for dealing with the trials of life. <clears throat> these people that I will name later, these organizations, these churches, no matter what they say, and they will say we believe in the sufficiency of scripture, they do not believe in the sufficiency of scripture for dealing with the trials of life, period. I'm going to do some uh, verses here that we're all familiar with. And I'm going to say that here are a few verses God has given us, and we need to be aware of what he has given us and not replace what he's given us with something else. <clears throat> okay, we start. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay. Now, those of you who study Greek know when the word all comes up, it's the same in English as in Greek. And what happens is, this word, it's going to make God's people perfect. Immediately, no, but it will be perfecting us. Second verse here, according as his divine power hath given unto us all, there's that word again, things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. All things, not a few, all things. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now let's pause here a little bit. We have all these psychotherapists out there. We have all these psychotherapies out there. And here we have one verse from Scripture that says <clears throat> that what we have, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's no psychotherapy. There's no psychotherapist that can give us this. They can make promises, but only God has this. Going on to Jeremiah, speaking of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Now, if you follow the heart throughout the scripture and you see what God has to say about the heart, heart this is the revelation that we have for ourselves and for others when we minister to them. <clears throat> now, you show me one psychotherapy, one psychotherapist that will tell a client your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You will not find that. <clears throat> uh, 
We have also <clears throat> that he has, see, he's given us the word. <clears throat> he's given us the work of the Holy Spirit. And he's given us the fellowship of believers. We are in a church here. We are the fellowship of believers. And so we have the ability to minister to one another. And it says in Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Just with those, sorry, just with those uh, verses, uh, just a few verses, I could give hundreds of verses in which we have ways that God has given us to minister to ourselves and then to minister to others. We uh, have uh, a number of people that call our ministry, and, and some of them uh, talk about counseling that they've been in. And what they say is something like this. <clears throat> I go to a counselor. She is a licensed counselor, and she only does Bible with me. And I, I, I say, oh, really? She is a licensed counselor. She only does counseling with you. I don't know how it is in the other 49 states. I know in California that would be regarded as being unethical because she's licensed. She has a license to perform a service. She has to perform that particular service for the client. Now, another thing I usually ask is, okay, did you pay for that service? And usually it's, yes, I paid for the service. And very often the person is referred out by the pastor of the church. And I say, okay, now, if you paid for that surface, service, I have one word that I receive from the insurance companies that they pass on to me to pass on, along to people who pay for the service. And the person is a licensed counselor, only does biblical counseling. The word is fraud. And that's it, pure and simple. You cannot use a license for doing one thing and then provide entirely something else. I want to go through... Uh, how we got to this situation where all of a sudden this psychology has taken over most of the church. And I'll give examples, as I said at the end of my second talk. It, it's pretty much taken over the church. The timeline. <clears throat> we start from the day of Pentecost onward, and we come up to today almost 2,000 years. You have to decide, has the Lord God given us what we really need for life and godliness or not. And if he has, we don't need these substitutes, these counterfeits from the world, the flesh, or the devil, and they have literally swamped the church. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a history here, starting out from the beginning, coming up to today. Starting out, we have the cure of souls. <clears throat> That's in the historic literature. It's the sustaining and curative treatment of persons in those matters that reach beyond the requirements of the animal life. That's the way it was over the centuries. Now let's find out where did this all begin? And some people, you know, don't study the history, the literature, and so on. But psychotherapy actually began in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. 20th century psychotherapy is attributed in the literature to Franz Anton Mesmer. And Mesmer said, there is only one illness and one healing. Now Mesmer was, by the way, an Austrian physician. So you're going to wonder, what's the relationship between an Austrian physician, medicine, and present-day psychotherapy? Well, I'll be spelling that out. He believed that all human ailments can be explained and treated according to the presence of dynamic forces that are in the universe. He described it as an invisible fluid or energy, and he called it animal magnetism. He said, uh, and this is, this is a, a wonderful book that spells this all out. He said, since there was only one cause of illness, it followed that there was only one truly effective mode of healing, the restoration of equilibrium to the body's supply of animal magnetism. 
Now what's, what's the relationship between that and psychotherapy? We have to go on in order to do this. Robert Fuller's book is a very interesting read if you want to find out how this leads up to today and comes to psychotherapy. What happened was uh, Mesmer was a rather theatrical man and when he dealt with people he would uh, first have this large tub, magnets, because he's dealing with this one illness, he's dealing with animal magnetism and the theory is basically this. With the disequilibrium in the body, we need to reestablish the equilibrium through these magnets. Eventually, the whole magnet, tub, and all the rest was set aside, and he moved on to sitting down one-to-one -one with people. He would, uh, he's described as saying, put knees together, <clears throat> uh, thumbs in palms. He was very theatrical, made passes at them, and then this one little phrase comes out in, in the description historically. He looked, he looked at his patient fixedly. You, you get this? With all the theatrics, you know where that's going. Okay. And so what we have both in Europe and in America, and it happened both uh, simultaneously, they went from the body to the mind. They went from bodily manipulation to conversation and there it is, the mind, they discovered, is the gateway to the body. So the magnets are not necessary anymore, and we can just go right to conversation. There's a man that uh, Fuller attributes uh, the beginning in America. He says, Phineas P. Quimby is the rightful father of the many self-help psychologies. Why? Because that's exactly the way that he functioned. And looking at mes mesmerism, this is the way they spell it out in the literature. Mesmerism led to hypnosis. Remember the theatrics and fixedly looking at people? It led to psychotherapy. Remember the mind is the gateway to the body. Not only for bodily ailments, though, but for mental ailments. And then finally, positive thinking. Fuller describes how new thought followed it. Mary Baker Eddy, Norman Vincent Scheele, uh, Peel, Robert Schuller, and we all know about the secret. And the secret, if you w look at the descriptions uh, regarding that, the reviews, they, they trace it right back to uh, Mesmer. And <clears throat> Fuller says, the first psychological system to provide individuals with curative services that have traditionally been classified under the rubric cure of souls. Now, tracing this history as I want to bring it up to date, <clears throat> bring it into the church, what happened and got, how did it get into the church. We have Dr. Thomas Saz. Saz is probably the best known psychiatrist in the world because uh, there's an expression they use about him. They say that Saz is the great deflator of psychiatric pretensions. And Saz himself, by the way, is a psychiatrist. But in following this, he says, with the decline of religion and the growth of science in the 18th century, the cure of sinful souls, which had been an integral part of the Christian religions, was recast as the cure of sick minds and became an integral part of medical science. So there, there's a big leap. Now the paren there, that's not an editorial paren in each case. The paren sinful, that's Saz's word. Sick, that's Saz's word. So we went from the historic cure of souls to what? We went to the cure of minds. We see the next uh, person in the sequence here. Everybody recognizes Dr. Sigmund Freud with his famous cigar and his famous statement that sometimes a cigar is only a cigar. He lived from 1856. <laughs> I just did that to see if you were still awake. <laughs> from 1856 to 1939. <clears throat> and he had... Uh, an impact that very few people realize. Uh, his impact is throughout the church. People who talk about the unconscious in a way that Freud described it as a determinant, determinant of behavior, don't even know they're being Freudian, but they are. What we have here is uh, that uh, E.M. Thornton says probably no single individual has had a more profound effect on 20th century thought 
than Sigmund Freud. His works have influenced psychiatry, anthropology, social work, penology, and education and provided a seemingly limitless source of material for no novelists and dramatists. For better or worse, he has changed the face of society, and he's been very instrumental in changing the church. How? Through the writers who just pick this up. They just absorb it. Now, <clears throat> uh, Freud had this particular theory called psychoanalysis. He talked about the early psychosexual stages of development. He uh, had an intensive relationship with the patient. And what we have here is an actual photo of where uh, Sigmund Freud functioned. You have the couch, you have the chair at the end. The person has to free associate. That's part of the contract between patient and the psychiatrist. That what that means is, whatever comes to the patient's mind, no, no matter how amusing, obscene, or whatever, he's to relate that to the psychiatrist. The, the, part, part, the part of the problem with psychiatry is this. When you know that the patient comes in three to five times a week, you get that? And you're seeing a medical doctor, you see how expensive that is? So that kind of opened the door for other psychotherapies. But prior to the rise of psychotherapy, that as we know it today, all we had was psychoanalysis. Getting into the 19th and the 20th century, what we look at is there were a number of factors that were functioning and operating that brought in more severely psychotherapy. One of them, Darwinian evolution, and then back to Freud, Freudian theories of the powerful unconscious driving behavior. You can see a little Gnosticism coming out here. It's below, you know, the conscious level. There's something going on. We don't quite know what it is, but we can find out what it is. And then seeming contradictions between science and the Bible. Okay, these are seeming. Then what happened was Christians adjusted their faith to all of this newfound, so to, call, so to speak, knowledge. And what we see is the counseling began to expand through Freudian psychoanalysis in the hands of psychiatrists. That existed uh, primarily and almost solely prior to Second World War. Then we had the development of the field of clinical psychology in colleges and universities around 1950. In the first half of the 20th century, Ellen Herman, in her book, The Romance of American Psychology, says, throughout the entire post-war era, the United States has trained and employed more psychological experts per capita than any other country in the world. <clears throat> I'm going to move ahead to, uh, you know, something that very few people know about. And that's this particular book, The Practice of Psychology, The Battle for Professionalism. Between 1955 and 1995, we have the professionalism of psychology. Up to the Second World War, what we had is solely psychoanalysis. This book is written by 14 individuals and these 14 individuals are the dirty dozen. Now, that's not an editorial on my part. That's what they call themselves. And they admit it right up front in the book. We are the 14 guys who brought about the revolution in psychotherapy in America. Read the book. You'll see that that's true. And what they say is we did it through politics and money. They say at the beginning of their book, the independent provision of psychological services was virtually non-existent prior to and during World War II. We had psychoanalysis. That was it. Most psychology departments tended to look down on applied practitioners, in other words, psychotherapists, feeling that the true psychologist was the one functioning in an academic setting. So what we have is the scientifically oriented individuals and, remember, psychoanalysis, intensive, expensive. There's this other clinical psychology coming in. And what happens is now we have a less expensive way to do it and we have a 
more opportunity provided how? By politics and money. And they did it by devil's deals. Here again, their language, not mine. The devil's deals were simply this. The U.S. government, the Rockefeller Foundation, private grants and others. There's money here, guys. And if you want the money, you're going to have to expand your clinical psychology departments and start producing these practitioners. These guys are telling this in this book. And so what's happened there is through these devil's deals, you have expansion. How? We who are an educator in, in education know that there is FTE. What is FTE? That's full-time equivalent. Every time you add a full-time equivalent, whether it's at University of California or Chafer Seminary, when you increase your FTE, you increase the budget. And so there's all of a sudden this rising tremendous interest in people being practitioners for some of the th reasons I had set, uh, set up just prior to this. And so they want to get the education, they want to get the licenses, and that's what they were doing. How? Through the devil's deal. That's how they were de dealing it because they would give the money, they would expand the clinical psychology, they would produce the licensed individuals, and now they start flooding out into the uh, community. And as long as they could convince the public of the need for their professional expertise and keep the facade of science, the psychological practitioners were able to divorce themselves from the results of research and sell their talk therapy to as many people as possible. And so what you have is <clears throat> uh, these guys... They came in, politics and money. They had the devil's deals that were going on, and you have the current situation. What is the current situation? Sorry. You have now uniform educational programs throughout. You know, let's go back. When did they start? Here's an interesting note that they, uh, the Dirty Dozen, proudly say of themselves. They say, you know, in 1965, the UC, that's University of California, nine campuses, and the CSU, California State University, 19 campuses, graduated, 1965, only eight clinical doctoral students, 1965, largest university in the world in 1965. Can you see the recency of this and how rapidly it swallowed up the church? Next, state licensing. <clears throat> State licensing is only about 50 years old. Connecticut, New York, and California began the state licensing. Only about 50 years old. Insurance reimbursements, here's the big one. The insurance reimbursements are less than 40 years old. Can you see what's happening? You bring together insurance reimbursements, you have the uniform educational programs, you have the state licensing, <clears throat> then the next phase you know, is about to begin. But first, 1950. No state licensing, no insurance reimbursements, no uniform graduate programs, no Bible college, Christian university, or seminary programs promoting psychotherapy. And today, most of them in some way or other are promoting psychotherapy. <clears throat> in the last 50 years, we've had a dramatic shift in uh, confidence in the Word of God. We have gone from the cure of souls, sufficiency of the word, to the cure of minds, and all of these psychotherapists coming into the church, appealing to pastors, and then people being referred out. This shift occurred as people increasingly began looking to psychology for answers about all facets of life, who we are, why we are here, how we are to behave, and how we are to relate to one another, how we change, and how we should live. <clears throat> All of these things came in, and then in the 1960s, and uh, I was a vice president at Santa Barbara City College for 35 years, I was a part, I was assigned to these meetings. Meetings. You'd have pastors invited by the mental health community to have meetings, and we let, met at the local hospital, and the psychotherapists are talking the pastors into the idea that they may be able to handle spiritual problems, but these are different. You need to refer out. And I would listen to all this. And, uh, you know, I'm in a public role. I'm representing the college. And, you know, I listen. I digest. Very disappointed. But this was happening 
all over America. Then we had the psychological awakening in the church. What was that? As you build up the academics in the universities, I mean, they're academics. I mean, you can't question academics, can you? And you build those up, then the church, all of a sudden, they see greater and greater confidence in that. And then what happens is, all of a sudden, and this happened locally where I was, and I'm sure nationally, the pastors are becoming marriage and family therapists. They go back and get their counseling licenses. And so this is what happened over a period of time. And so we have today a referral system that's mostly in place for most pastors, and I'll be quoting some in my second talk, to refer out to psychotherapists. I want to take a little sidebar here for those of you who are pastors. I've heard from pastors that they refer out because they're afraid of a lawsuit. Now that is straight out in one word, bogus. And what they remember is, oh, but you remember what happened to Grace Community Church, John MacArthur and this Nally versus Grace Community Church. I remember it very well. I was very closely in touch with it during that period of time. And what happened is, Ken Nally, 24-year-old seminary student, committed suicide. Uh, Parents, Roman Catholics, he became a convert. And for whatever reason, um, I don't want to make any accusations, but, you know, they pursued it. They pursued it regardless because attorneys will tell you this is a useless lawsuit, but some people want their day in court. They pursued it. Then it went to the California Supreme Court upon appeal. And um, Grace Community Church uh, won in both instances. But these people, they remember that. Now, you could be sued as a pastor either for referring out or for not referring out. Why? Because the answer to the question of can somebody sue, you know if you have an attorney who advises you about things, they'll say, yeah, somebody could sue. Now, I, I, I have one case to just briefly tell you about. Tom and Lucy Rutherford, Assembly of God pastor. <clears throat> His daughter was, in this case, was counseled by the wife of the pastor. She went into this recovered memory therapy and said all kinds of obscene things about her father. And finally, when this was all over, she retracted, asked her parents for forgiveness, and the settlement, they didn't go to a trial, the settlement was $1 million reinstatement of his pastor's license. And that's that's a well-known case, but... People, you know, pastors, they remember what? They remember the Grace Community Church versus uh, Nally. There's an interesting twist. Sam Erickson, by the way, was an attorney involved in this case. And there's an interesting twist here that uh, I think is very interesting. I think the pastors will think so too. The propriety of imposing on the clergy a duty to refer leads to the question of whether the court should create a reciprocal legal duty on the part of the mental health professionals, such as psychiatrists and psychologists, to refer to clergymen all spiritual cases, the simple as well as the serious, with a consequent liability for failing to refer their patients to the proper clergyman in the event of suicide, suicide referring to Ken Nally. Now, somebody could sue a therapist for not referring to a pastor and vice versa. The likelihood of winning is, you know, if you know law at all, there's no mandate in law in any of the 50 states for a pastor to refer out. And let me be, you know, a little bit maybe silly about this. You're not required to refer out to a medical doctor, to a, an electrician, to a carpenter, etc. You're just not re- required to refer out. So if you are doing that for that particular reason, Nally versus Grace Community Church, you need to stop doing that. There's this uh, term, Christian psychology. Uh, there's no such thing as Christian psychology. I, if, if you ask the ones who are the Christian psychologists, they'll, they'll have to admit this. There is a man who uh, is a member of the Christian Association for Psychological Studies. He said, we are often asked if we are Christian psychologists and find it difficult to answer since we don't know what the question implies. We are Christians who are psychologists, but at the present time, 
There is no acceptable Christian psychology that is markedly different from non-Christian psychology. Okay? It is difficult to imply that we function in a manner that is fundamentally distinct from our non-Christian colleagues, as yet there is not an acceptable theory, mode of research, or treatment methodology that is distinctly Christian. I think every one of them would have to admit to that. There isn't. There just plain isn't. There isn't Christian psychology. It's just a whole bunch of individuals who are Christians who have licenses and they are practicing. We did a, a survey, actually, of CAPS, Christian Association for Psychological Study, some years back. The, the bottom line, the end of it, you know, conclusion was, the Christian psychologist is as eclectic, meaning they take from a variety of sources and have an eclectic approach, as their secular counterparts. That, that's the bottom line on the uh, research that we did. <clears throat> J. Vernon McGee, I think everybody knows that name, hopefully. <clears throat> he described Christian psychology this way. So-called Christian psychology is secular psychology clothed in pious platitudes and religious rhetoric. Now, why, why, why do Christians trust this type of psychology? First, they usually say, well, you know, they kind of absorb the fact that it's in academia, in the universities, in the colleges, in the Bible colleges, in the seminaries, in the, in the university, that it goes on and on. And they think it's maybe science, and it is not science. There is, uh, you know, just on face value, just common sense. You look at it, you think about the Freudian psychosexual stages of development, the unconscious, it just goes on and on. What, this is science? No, it is not science. What it is simply is, it's a bunch of individuals, none of whom that I know of is a Christian. They are in the realm of darkness, have figured out what life is all about, and they have promoted it to others, and they have gotten into the universities. They now control the American Psychological Association and so on. Well, let's get down to bottom here. We look at it, Dr. Linda Rebel, Theory of self, as Self-Portrait and the Ideal of Objectivity. Theories of human nature reflect the theorist's personality as he or she externalizes it or projects it onto humanity at large. The theory of human nature is a self-portrait of the therapist. There it is, and here it is again. It is my intention, Dr. Harvey Mindus, makers of psychology, the personal factor, it is my intention to show how the leaders of the field portray humanity in their own image and how each one's theories and techniques are a means of validating his own identity. Their outlooks are shaped by who they are. There's no shame in that, but it is a crime against truth to deny it. <clears throat> there is a, a philosopher of science, Sir Car Karl Popper. Uh, some regard him as the greatest philosopher of science of the last century. And he examined Freudian psychology, etc. And he says this. Though these theories, though posing as sciences, had in fact more in common with primitive myths than with science, that they resembled astrology rather than astronomy, these theories describe some facts, but in the manner of myths, they contain most interesting psychological suggestions, but not in testable form. Now, what we have here is, most of you probably don't know, there are almost 500 approaches to psychotherapy. Okay? And again, none of these developed by people who are in the kingdom of light. Others who are not in the kingdom of light, therefore they're in the kingdom of darkness, are the ones that have come up with this. You will not see, uh, I use Jeremiah, you will not see that in any theory. You will not see sin. You will not see repentance. You will not see, you know, well, <laughs> for sure, you will not see a day of judgment in any psychotherapy or uh, taught by any psychotherapist. That would get rid of a client fast, you know. There is a day of judgment, and that would end the, you know, no more sessions with you, no, no more income. So the most important matters of life that pastors get up and tell you about and that you read in the word and that you study with one another are not in the psychotherapist's 
psychotherapies and promoted by the psychotherapists unless they're crossing the line of the license and going into an area that they should not be in. These are profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred, and I would say seriously, concerning the faith. We have in our books, and I want to say here, our books are on the internet, free, ebooks, download, print, use them, uh, multiply them, and use them for study. But we have lots of quotes from other uh, philosophers of science in addition. Okay, well, if it's, not soci- if it's not science, okay, what is it? It is religion. You're going to say, no, stop right there. I don't know if I can accept that, okay? You go to Google, you put in atheism as religion plus courts. You know what you come up with? Atheism is a religion, okay? So let let me just go into this. If they can do it with atheism, you know, there are other ways to take a look at it. Wikipedia, religion has been defined in a variety of ways. One's primary worldview and how that dictates one's thoughts and actions. Many writers have said this just blatantly, and there are books written about this type of psychology as religion. Here's one, Psychotherapy as Religion. Dr. William Epstein is a professor. He calls it the civil divine in America. You notice the woman's necklace and what's at the end? (laughs) Couch, okay? And that's the kind of point he is making with respect to it. Dr. Thomas Saws again, The human relations we now call psychotherapy are in fact matters of religion. Yes, pastors, stop referring out. And we mislabel them as therapeutic at great risk to our spiritual well-being. He goes on to say, Herein lies one of the supreme ironies of modern psychotherapy. It is not merely a religion that pretends to be a science. It is actually a fake religion that seeks to destroy true religion. Saz also says, he warns of the implacable resolve of psychotherapy to rob religion of as much as it can and to destroy what it cannot. Psychotherapy has become popular in the lifetimes of most people here. It's not been around forever. Ellen Herman says, Psychological insight is the creed of our time. In the name of enlightenment, experts promise help in faith, knowledge, and comfort. They devise confident formulas for happy living and ambitious plans for dissolving the knots of conflict. Psychology, according to its boosters, and she's referring to psychotherapy, possesses worthwhile answers to our most difficult personal questions and practical solutions for our most intractable social problems. Does that or does that not sound like religion to you? Yes, it's religion. Going on, she says, In the late 20th century United States, we are likely to believe what psychological experts tell us. They speak with authority to a vast audience and have become familiar figures in most communities, in the media, and in virtually every corner of popular culture. Their advice is big business. The Romance of American Psychology was published in 1995. It's even more true today. What we have here is the movement from the cure of souls to the cure of minds is now complete. Most Christians have moved from a sufficiency of scripture, in what sense, for problems of living normally sent to a psychotherapist, to an insufficiency of scripture position. Okay, that's what has happened. Psychotherapy has debased and largely replaced the work of the pastors and has replaced what the Word of God says about issues of life. And because it, it, it has, we need to reject it wherever it appears in the church. In 1986, J. Vernon McGee wrote an article in which he warned about the psychology, uh, psychologi- psychologizing of Christianity. Excuse me. He said in a personal letter to us, he gave us written endorsements for our work, but he said, 
I see that this matter of psychologizing Christianity will absolutely destroy Bible teaching and Bible churches. And that is a prophecy that is more and more coming true. And when you look at the therapeutic language, and when you look at the most popular books that are in the church, what we find is we have self-esteem, low self-esteem, emotional wounds, the unconscious, felt needs, rejection, emotional healing, positive self-regard, negative emotions, addiction, codependence, compulsion, midlife crisis syndrome, trauma, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. We have a longer list. And if you take those and you cross those out of the books of these that are the most popular in the church, you're going to eliminate a lot of what they have to say. (laughs) That's part of the question and answer, (laughs) Tommy. What we have is a psychological gospel, a priesthood of mental health professionals, a psychological belief system, churches filled with potential mental health customers. This is a current fulfillment of prophecy For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that truly is what's happening in the church. The psychotherapeutic mindset fuels the therapy industry and gives Christians a false view of the human condition a false justification for putting one's own mental, emotional well-being as the top priority rather than the great commandment. Why is it a false view of the human condition? Because we already have the true view of the human condition. We don't need these other views. A false view of God that places personal happiness over Christ's call to follow him. The old self is to be put off, not rehabilitated. We have that he put off Concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We have in uh, the psychological wisdom of men only nurtures the flesh which Jesus tells us to deny. And Jesus we know has said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Paul rightly warns, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain conceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Psychological theories and therapies represent a form of modern Gnosticism. Who in this universe truly knows mankind? There's only one, capital O, And he has given this to us in his word. If we're going to take some other approach, we are actually taking up a counterfeit in place of what God has truly given us. Integrating psychotherapy and its underlying psychologies with Christianity dishonors God, denies his promises, demotes God's word to a lesser place, interferes with the work of the Holy Spirit, ends up being a form of spiritual harlotry. This is a little leaven that has come to full loaf in the church. We are told, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. There's a heart again. Lean not on thine own understanding or the understanding of psychotherapists. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. James Turner wrote a book, Without God, Without Creed. And he deals with how disbelief in God became an option for millions in America. And he says, and I'm quoting, It wasn't because of Darwinism scientific, naturalism, industrialization, urbanization, and technological changes in themselves, but rather because of the response of religious leaders to these developments. Religious leaders to these developments. He says, in trying to adapt their religious beliefs to socioeconomic change, to new moral challenges, to novel problems of knowledge, to the tightening standards of science, the defenders of God slowly strangled him. And he points out different names we know historically, believers who did not come to the defense of the sufficiency of the word of God when it comes to issues of light. We have a friend who's 
gone on to be with the Lord, W. Philip Keller. His book, um, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. How many of you are familiar with that? We're very, yeah, okay. We, he lived uh, six months, he and his wife, in Canada, six months in Santa Barbara, so we socialized with him. And he was a man of few words, and when he said something, you, this kind of guy, you, you really pay attention. So we were lamenting all these things. Uh, he had given us a couple of endorsements for our books. And um, he said uh, this very slowly, but very uh, concerned. He said, uh, Martin, uh, Deidre, uh, the men of God have lost confidence in the word of God. That's what he summed it up as. Following that, he, he wrote the book, and this is not a joke, he wrote the book Predators in Our Pulpits. It's exactly what came a year after that. Adapting to the surrounding society has always been a detriment to the faith once delivered unto the saints. Let's take a look at some of the precursors. We have Paul Tournier, Clyde Naramore, Henry Brandt. Academic institutions to promote it, we have Fuller Seminary, first approved in 1972 by the American Psychological Association. Rosemead Graduate School at Biola University, Wheaton College, George Fox University, and later Liberty University and Regent University. Those institutions, I'm not saying the professors there, do not stand on the sufficiency of the word of God for problems of living normally taken to a psychotherapist. Following these beginnings, we had thousands of students getting trained, going out as psychotherapists. What happens? They get into the congregations and pastor. You know, we, I have a license, and please refer people out to me. And then you have hundreds of Bible colleges. You have hundreds of Christian universities. You have hundreds of seminaries, even, who genuflect to it in some form or another. There's a verse from Jeremiah that we've used to end two of our books. No, let me, let me say this first because I, that's, that's quoting myself. It is paradoxical and oxymoronic that as more and more atheists and secularists are rejecting psychotherapy, more and more Christians are embracing it. Okay, now, we have, strangely enough, atheists who support our academic work our academic research. I mentioned Dr. Thomas Saz, one of the best-known psychiatrists in the world. Listen again to what he says. Psychotherapy is not only a religion that pretends to be a science, but it is a fake religion that seeks to replace true religion. Dr. Thomas Saz is an atheist. I can name one atheist after another who sees this, but you try to name really well-known Christians in the church, and I'll be naming some, who see this, absolutely not. They don't see it, and they are promoting worldwide, in one particular case, this, what we call, psycho-heresy. Here's the verse. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out, cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. We have from... God, the, he's a fountain of living waters. These broken cisterns, that's all that they have. And they've made inroads into the church and now spread right throughout the church with major ministries, uh, supporting these individuals, promoting their work, and it goes on and on. I <clears throat> end with three questions. Okay. Do we believe God's word and all the promises that it contains for believers? You have to answer that. Okay? Do we believe that he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness? There's that word, all again. Okay? Do we believe that his word is sufficient and that it does what it says it does? Mm. Lord, we're, uh, <laughs> we're reminded that... Uh, you, uh, you yourself said, Jesus, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? We are the ones of the faith. We need to exercise that faith. We need to believe the words that have been given. We need to have confidence 
in the sufficiency of the Word of God for problems of living, for life's issues, for dealing with tragedies, for dealing with all manner of things that occur in life. And we have tons more to offer individual than individuals and psychotherapists. And so I just pray that uh, if some here are in the referral mode, promotion of those who are more popular in the church, most popular, that they will rethink about this and they will hopefully come to the decision that, yes, I believe in the sufficiency of the word for all problems that are normally sent to a psychotherapist. I ask for this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And we're going to have time for 15 minutes, 15 minutes for questions and answers. So, uh, <coughs> who has a question for Dr. Bob? Bruce. I just wanted to point a clarification if I could get it. Earlier you said that a person was a licensed counselor and they only did biblical counseling, they would be committing fraud. Did I hear you wrong or, or if so, if that was correct, could you further explain yeah. that? What I did say is um, licensing is such that if you had a, a, if you're a medical doctor, you have a medical license, and somebody comes in and you say you only do something else besides medicine, you are, are, you know, uh, it's unethical to do that. And you could be disciplined for it. Okay. With a psychotherapist, the same thing. If you are licensed, in fact, we even name on our um, site an individual who is a Christian, licensed uh, psychologist in the state of Pennsylvania. He's, lo- he's on the list of the uh, insurance company. I call the insurance company, and I ask the insurance company, well, what about this person? And, yeah, he's on our list. I said, well, if you go to their site, you'll see that they only provide biblical counseling. And he said, well, I'll tell you this. Um, we're the, uh, the sixth largest insurance company in America, and if they're only doing uh, biblical counseling instead of functioning according to their uh, license and they're, we're reimbursing, that's fraud. Now, what happens actually is the words biblical counselor and the words Christian counselor are disseminated so thoroughly that uh, Frank Minereth, Paul Meyer, and just a bunch of the others, they say they do Christian counseling. I mean, the American Association of Christian Counselors, this is uh, false. The American Association of Christian Counselors are integrationists. They are ones who use the Bible and they use psychology. So if somebody represents them, Cells with a license, and they only do biblical counseling. That it, that would not be considered fraud because they're not getting uh, the money issue hasn't come in. But it is considered to be a um, uh, potential disciplinary action for uh, not uh, functioning within the license. So, if I follow, so the license itself says that you must use secular techniques. Is it specific mm-hmm. like that? Well, any license that you have, medical doctor, chiropractor, uh, psychotherapist, when you have the license and you advertise yourself as psychotherapist, medical doctor, chiropractor, you have to function within that license or the uh, license issuing board is going to uh, deal with a complaint if somebody ever complained about you. So it's, it's, it's really not to be done. So you don't have the freedom to use whatever technique you want. Well, uh, let me explain it this way. Uh, by the way, an issue last year, uh, uh, psychiatric uh, bulletin, they say this to psychiatrists. <clears throat> it's rather interesting. Uh, this issue had to do with uh, the spiritual part of man in psychiatric practice. And when you read the journal, which I did, I found out what they're talking about is uh, a passing remark to appreciate the spiritual nature of most people, whereas most psychiatrists are not uh, Christians, they um, are just plain not. And so you can warm them up, essentially, is what they were saying, by recognizing that. If you needed to have somebody, you could call in the chaplain at the hospital to pray, whatever. But 
they give you a latitude to get into the spiritual realm. But can they, how far can they get in there? That's, that's where the problem, uh, you know, comes up. See, if, if a psychotherapist, a Christian psychotherapist said, oh, I know, you go to my church, uh, could we start with a prayer? Okay, after that, um, he has to uh, operate, no, I'll change the gender. She has to operate, I'll tell you why in my second talk, but she has to operate um, within her license. She can't operate outside of her license. She can't make that the predominant theme of uh, what she's doing. And if she charges, yeah, it's fraud. It's, it's just uh, misusing your license to practice something other. I mean, if you went to a medical doctor and uh, he said, well, you know, I don't believe in using medicine. Well, medical doctors are what? They're allopaths. What are